Hey everybody, Chris Masterjohn here of chrismasterjohnphd.com and I'm here to talk to you today about a new study on doing CrossFit on a ketogenic diet. And this is a master's thesis by Rachel Gregory of James Madison University and it's the study is entitled A Low Carbohydrate Ketogenic Diet Combined with 6 Weeks of CrossFit Training Improves Body Composition and Performance. And the title is slightly misleading because what it actually shows is that the ketogenic diet does not hurt the performance gains that come with doing CrossFit. Uh, But I think if you go on to read the abstract even, let alone the rest of the paper, I think it becomes clear that that is essentially what the author is trying to say. And I think overall, this is accurately presenting Uh, the data that's contained in the master's thesis. But I also don't think that it really gets to the heart of what I would be concerned about in terms of the potential for a ketogenic diet to hurt performance. And I also don't think it gets to the heart of the questions that I would be asking about the potential downsides for some people in chronic severe carbohydrate restriction. So I want to briefly show you what the study found and then uh, and then go in greater detail into the questions that I personally think are so important. So what they did in this study was they took people who had been doing CrossFit for at least a month and they randomly allocated them to a control diet on the left or a ketogenic diet on the right. And they, everyone just kept doing what they were doing for CrossFit, except the control group kept eating the same way they were eating. The ketogenic diet went on a ketogenic diet, was a, which was achieved by bringing the carbo, primarily by bringing the carbohydrate content of the diet very, very low. Um, and then they tested their body weight, body fat, and other measures of body composition at the beginning and the end of the study. And then they also tested their performance on a particular standardized CrossFit workout before and after the study. And so what you can see here is that the weight is measured in kilograms. So you have to slightly more than double it to think of it in pounds. But basically the ketogenic diet group lost an average of six to seven pounds and the control group did not lose any weight. The ketogenic diet group had a decrease in body mass, had a decrease in body fat percentage, had a decrease in fat mass, and did not have a change in lean mass. You can look at this and you can see lean mass was slightly lower. It was not statistically significant. I'm satisfied with saying that they didn't lose any lean mass. And this is encouraging because Usually, if people just restrict calories, they do lose a significant portion of lean mass. But then again, it's not surprising because these people are doing CrossFit. CrossFit involves resistance exercise that provides an anabolic stimulus to the muscles that will, in a hypercaloric diet, providing enough protein will help you build muscle mass and in a hypocaloric diet that causes weight loss will help you preserve lean mass. And it's overwhelmingly the case that we know from the existing body of literature that that anabolic stimulus from resistance exercise is the single most important way to preserve lean mass. And we know from the existing literature that consuming adequate protein is the second most important point. So there's nothing particularly surprising that losing a pound a week over six weeks in the ketogenic diet, most of that did not come from lean mass in the context of CrossFit. The other important point here is that the ketogenic diet did not hurt performance. And this is actually more interesting than the other findings because one of the concerns in using carbohydrate restricted diets for athletes is that the carbohydrate restriction could hurt Perform athletic performance because you are providing less carbohydrate to the muscles and you are decreasing their glycogen stores. And it's thought that glycogen stores, which is the stored carbohydrate content of muscle, plays an important role in performance. Now, what you're seeing for the performance measure here is a measure of how many seconds did it take them to, to do the standardized workout. And what you can see is that 
um, at the beginning, they were operating on a little over 400 seconds. And in both cases, they lost 40 to 60 seconds on the workout. And the loss is shown in the third column and in the sixth column. And you can see that the ketogenic diet, they lost a little bit more time than the control diet. That was not statistically significant. And so overall, we can say that um, a loss in time means that they did the same amount of work in less time, so they improved their performance. Overwhelmingly, what caused them to improve their performance at a CrossFit workout was that they continued to do CrossFit for six weeks, and the ketogenic diet did not interfere with that. I would add one caveat to this, that the CrossFit workout that was used to test performance was a 500-meter row followed by 40 bodyweight squats, 30 ab mat sit-ups, 20 hand release push-ups, 10 pull-ups. With the exception of the 500 meter row, all of these are bodyweight exercises. And if you lose seven pounds, even if you don't get better at the exercise, you should improve your time on the workout because you're pushing less weight around. That makes me ask the question, should we have seen the ketogenic diet group do even better than the control group on these exercises because they had a handicap in losing seven pounds. Um, but then again, uh, maybe that's exactly what we're seeing here when we see that the ketogenic diet group caught 14 more seconds off of the uh, control group and the study was just statistically underpowered to show that was a statistically significant difference. I think at this point we're debating minutia and this is very relevant to a competitive athlete where that athlete is trying to shave the last five or 10 seconds off of a workout in order to compete and place better than someone else who is just as good as, that, as they are. Uh, but it's not re relevant to the average Joe and I think the if you read this paper, it really seems like what they're trying to get at is, is the combination of a ketogenic diet and a CrossFit workout, is that combination a legitimate way to lose weight and, um, and get fit and have fun and have a social support network that makes the program sustainable for the average person who wants to achieve those goals? And I think for that purpose... This study shows that, yes, it is an option. I think this sentence towards the beginning of the paper really encapsulates how this fits into the rest of the literature on weight loss. Additionally, the AHA ACC TOS guidelines for the management of overweight and obesity in adults lists a low-carbohydrate diet as one of the 15 dietary approaches that is effective for weight loss. 15 dietary approaches... For weight loss, that's a pretty big toolkit. I think the reality is as many permutations as you could have of these diets, you could have more and more tools in that kit. Ultimately, anything that is going to help you create a caloric deficit in a way that leaves you feeling satiated and energetic in a way that is consistent with your psychological and behavioral traits that allows you personally to make it sustainable is the thing that's going to be an effective weight loss tool for you. And that's going to be different for everyone. So it's nice that the ketogenic diet is one of the approaches in this very, very large toolkit that we have for weight loss. I want to switch gears now and talk about why I really don't think that this study is getting to the heart of my concerns about how a carbohydrate restri restriction would potentially hurt athletic performance or how it would potentially hurt our hormonal systems. And I'm not saying that it was asking the wrong questions. I'm just saying that it's not asking questions that I think are very important. So if we look at the performance times, what we see is that overall, these people were working in the range of saying, can I take this seven minute workout and make it a six minute workout? And those types of workouts are not the types of workouts that are most dependent on carbohydrate for performance. What I'm going to show you now to back that up is from the textbook Modern Nutrition in Health and Disease. 
And it's from chapter 112, Physical Activity, Fitness, and Health by Gary Hunter. What this chart here is showing you is the three different systems of energy metabolism across time. And so it takes us from one second of continuous activity through 1800 seconds of continuous activity. And it shows these systems in white, gray, or blue. So the white zone is the system that's dependent on creatine. The gray zone is the system that's dependent exclusively on glucose or carbohydrate. The blue zone is the zone that is flexible in terms of supporting it with carbohydrate, protein, or fat. And this blue zone, oxidative phosphorylation, is the zone that because we can support it with carbohydrate, protein, or fat, it is very flexible. And that is the zone that can be keto adapted or fat adapted. This white zone is supported by creatine. And that doesn't really have much to do with fat or carbohydrate. It mainly has to do with your endogenous synthesis of creatine and how much creatine you get in your diet. Your creatine in your diet is coming from meat, animal flesh, or it's coming from creatine supplements. And this white portion is primarily active at the very beginning of exercise. It's overwhelmingly dominant for exercise that's lasting up to 15 seconds. It loses a dramatic amount of its importance just after 15 seconds. And then after 90 seconds, it progressively becomes more and more irrelevant. By contrast, this blue zone is becoming slowly and increasingly relevant primarily as we get to things lasting more than 90 seconds. And then as we get longer and longer, it becomes overwhelmingly the dominant thing. Now, this blue zone on someone on a mixed diet, that's going to be largely carbohydrate. But in someone on a ketogenic diet, that's going to shift to largely flat because that's fat because that's the flexible zone. But this gray zone here is what's important for carbohydrate restriction. And that is overwhelmingly dominant at 15 to 90 seconds. And the reason that you can't really fat adapt this zone or keto adapt this zone is because this is what happens when the ATP utilization in your skeletal muscle is exceeding the rate at which oxygen is available to produce ATP through the oxidative phosphorylation, which is this blue zone. So when you start contracting your muscles very intensely, suddenly ATP utilization is dramatically increased and your nervous system needs to coordinate a response to deliver oxygen to that tissue. But that involves coordinating a greater breathing rate in your lungs, coordinating a greater heart rate, pumping faster, coordinating the delivery of oxygen through the blood pumped by the heart to the muscle tissue, perfusing the tissue, getting the oxygen into the cells, saturating that new level of oxygen. All of that is going to take a couple minutes to take place. And when you keto adapt or fat adapt, what you're doing is you're adapting the muscles to be able to increase the cellular machinery involved in taking up and utilizing ketones. That's not doing anything to adapt the rate at which your brain, your lungs, your heart, your blood vessels can all coordinate this delivery of oxygen. You can't, you can't really change that from diet all that much. And so let's think of the exercises that are really impacted by this 15 to 90 second range. When I think of exercises like that, I think of a five rep squat or a five rep deadlift or bench press or vertical press. So in the context of CrossFit, what I would want to see is if you take trained individuals who have a very strong sense of what their 5RM is, and then they take that well-trained 5RM and try over the course of six to eight weeks to push their 5RM to a new personal record or PR, can they do that as well on a low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet as they can on a mixed-carbohydrate-inclusive diet? 
That is where I would really see that to be impacted. Take this out of CrossFit. Where do you see contexts in which short bursts of energy lasting 15 to 90 seconds are really important? You see it in basketball, baseball, football, soccer, racquetball, tennis, basically every competitive sport that people have built a community around watching or, you know, the things that are popular to play for recreational purposes, those sports involve very intense bursts of energy and then periods of, of rest. And um, I'm not a sports fanatic, but you don't need to you don't need to watch basketball that many times to see that that's exactly what people are doing. And it's probably even more obvious in football or baseball that that's what's happening. So I would also like to see in people who are well trained, who are well trained, who and it, where it's important to try to push maximal performance. I'm not saying that you can't exercise for 60 seconds. I'm saying where it's really important for you to push maximal performance at something that lasts 15 to 90 seconds, like in all of these competitive sports, that's where I think carbohydrate can be really important. And that's where I would want to see the performance assessed. In in those two cases, in weightlifting across a 5RM and in all of these competitive sports. Now, I want to shift gears once more and explain the other thing that I that I really want to get to the heart of, which is, okay, you can perform, but what are the hormonal adaptations that allow you to maintain that performance? One of the adaptations is that you become less dependent on glucose as a fuel, but that is not, to borrow a term from economics, that is not perfectly elastic. There is some degree to which you are going to have to use some glucose. And to that degree, the more you restrict your carbohydrate, the more you're going to have to engage in a process called gluconeogenesis or the production of new glucose from non-glucose precursors, primarily protein and a little degree fat. Now, that process of gluconeogenesis is partly influenced and dependent on cortisol, which is an adrenal hormone involved in the stress response. And so then the question becomes... Are you getting too much of a stress response from the carbohydrate restriction in order to be able to support your performance at these activities? And so I am not going to go into the detail in this video about that because I've discussed it in detail elsewhere. And I would say if you want this to be really, if you want a, a, a more extensive discussion where this is well supported, I would encourage you to go to chrismasterjohnphd.com slash 11, which is where I used the Daily Lipid podcast episode 11 to, to, to discuss this in detail. But basically, when you have less insulin signaling from less carbohydrate, one of the things that can happen is that your thyroid ho hormone can fall. Your thyroid hormone biological activity, which is not just determined by the concentration of thyroid hormones in the blood, can fall because of other cellular processes. And that can result in less conversion of cholesterol to sex hormones, for example. So I would look on a personal level for the following things in blood work to substantiate that that could be happening. Low free T3, high cortisol, high LDL cholesterol, and low sex hormones. If you see three out of four of those things happening in a pattern, I would be concerned that you have some metabolic changes that are going to negatively impact your health in the long term that can best be supported by increasing the carbo carbohydrate content of your diet. And I think if whether that happens in you or doesn't happen in you is largely determined by how full is your stress bucket. There are many things that we could view as positive that we would include as stresses, fasting, carbohydrate restriction, weight loss, being so excited you can't sleep, work stress, emotional stress, psychological stress, all of these different things could be visualized as filling up a common pool of stress in this stress bucket. And if your stress bucket is full, 
because you have many other stresses or you have one or two other stressors that are really, really high in magnitude, then that may tip you to the point where you can't tolerate the stress of carbohydrate restriction. And I think that is going to be very, very individualized. I enjoyed being here. I hope you enjoyed watching this. If you want more about this topic, go to the show notes for the Daily Lipid Podcast episode 21 version of this discussion produced in parallel. That's at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash 21. This YouTube video is embedded there, but so is the downloadable or streamable podcast version of this discussion. You will also find there the show notes and the links to all the relevant material. All right, it's been great signing off. Chris Master John, PhD. Hope to see you in the next video.